Well, I'm sure by now everybody know I am the gypsy and I was born in Mayaro. So for Manzanilla to Guay Guayari, anything you want to know, feel free to ask me. A lot of people is under the wrong impression that Mayaro is only sea water and sand. Right about now, I would like to say it is so. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. The holiday haven that is Trinidad's east coast, formerly known as Bondelas, holds a special mystical charm. Winding seaside roads lined with miles of swaying coconut trees, the wild roar of the ocean, expansive wetlands that are home to abundant plant and wildlife, all herald the fact that there is something distinctive about the journey from Manzanilla to Guayaguayari. The name Manzanilla, Little Apple, is derived from the word Macanil, a round small fruit resembling an apple, which Spanish sailors saw in abundance on Manzanilla Point. The Macanil was deadly poisonous, but the monkey apple abounds in the Nariva swamp to this day and is very safe to eat. One site that every Trinbegonian associates with this part of the East Coast is the Kokal. The seemingly endless stretch of beach lovingly guarded by the coconut trees that stand watch like sleepy sentinels. In Jared Besso and Bridget Brereton's book of Trinidad, J. H. Collins writes, All the coconuts within range of vision belong to the fine estate called the Cocal. The story of how this incredible 16-mile estate came to be is an interesting one. Well, the Cocal had, of course, coconut trees all along that coast because of the there was a ship that got wrecked sometime in the 17th century and coconuts grew and on the map which I pointed out to, to you there you, you would see that when Captain Mallet passed by in 1797 he saw this and he he drew little coconut trees to indicate coconuts were growing coconut trees were growing there today the Cocal, Spanish for abundance of coconut trees is collectively owned by the San Juan Rotary Club these lands, bounded on the north by Titco's Manzanilla Beach facility, were purchased in an effort to protect the wetland environment of Nariva and the endangered manatee that makes the East Coast interior its home. Mr. Gupti Lachmedial is on the management committee of the non-profit Nariva Conservation Trust. What makes Nariva unique is a freshwater swamp and is the largest collection of fresh water in Trinidad in any swamp. The biodiversity in here is, 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 it would be different because it will sustain all species of, we have all species of mammals, birds and reptiles in this swamp. And it's also unique in the sense that it, because of the, the, the type of plant that they get in a wetland, there's, there's abundant food, food and life source of almost everything. The manatee, being vegetarian, eats everything green. And this is the ideal place. The Nariva swamp is inaccessible in a lot of areas that gives the manatee a good range to, to be able to, to feed in, in, and, be, and, and live in privacy. Now, River Swamp, again, is, 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 is unique in the sense that um, it is not fed by water that is heavily polluted. The water you see in the, all the color you see in the tunnel looking at one that is free of man-made pollution. The manatees are extremely shy creatures, and the best place to catch a glimpse of them is from a height on this thatched roof lookout. It's best to be quiet because they submerge at the slightest sound. In Trinidad and the Nervous Swamp area here, we have a smaller species from the Florida manatee, we are, which is the Antillian family cell by the Trichurus manatus. It, the, the size, the largest size that we have here may be eight or nine feet and maybe 1,200 pounds, the heaviest one. And we feel that there's about 18 or a little more than 18 in this swamp. And most people will know this area as deep pond. We call it deep pond because it's the deepest area along the coastline here that retain the most amount of water during the dry season. Now we, we consider it a highly sensitive area because it's an area that if the manatee feel threatened or they feel dis or they get disturbed anyway in any one of the feeding channels, the manatees will either head down to the Mitam River or they'll concentrate in this deep pond area here. Today the Mitam River mouth is a picturesque locale emptying the Nariva Swamp at the scenic point where a long underwater bank divides the river from the sea. The Nariva Swamp is like the main protagonist of the Manzanilla to Guayaguayari story, breathing life into the area and nurturing everything that relies on it. 
picturesque Palm Islands are surrounded by waters teeming with the legendary Cascaduro, commonly known as mudfish. We have the chip chip, the crab, and we cascado. Always in me, I'm uh, waiting for you. And any time in your life you want a good bunks, just remember that we could get for you the conks. Those who eat the cascado, the latest legend say, in Trinidad they would want to end their day. But once we make a dish for you, I want you to know you would really want to end your day in my room. Team! Ludo ding ding dine, I don't got a dine. Mayoro people, even children, are quite used to catching and cooking cascadu. The river fish is caught with a five-foot net that is wrapped around the wrist and held over the shoulder, throwing it out in a circular motion that gives the net a bell-like shape. The lead sinkers at the bottom of the net give it weight to trap the cascadu on the muddy riverbed. The best part is, of course, cooking the cascadu, which has a much sweeter flavor than other fish. It is fleshier with fewer bones and some say it is this earthy succulent taste that started this story. Once you eat cascado, you will always return to Trinidad. The children also learn how to catch conch in the swampy areas, feeling for the shape of the shells with their feet as they walk. Admiring chip chip on the beach and crab catching are also typical Mayaro activities. But the East Coast is rich with much more than food. The Ottawa River mouth is a bit further along the East Coast, where the spit formed paints a beautiful picture. There are interesting sites you can feast your eyes on way before you even reach the Kokal. Take the Plumiton Road in a southwesterly direction, and you will come to a great landmark of this area the Brigand Hill Lighthouse. Pitched majestically atop a steep hill, meant to send a bright signal to ships at night. In the daytime, however, it offers visitors breathtaking views of the East Coast, with the Atlantic Ocean breaking upon its shores, the rich vegetation of the Nariva Swamp, as well as the promontory of Point Radix, and the hills of the Northern Range. There is also an interesting sandstone feature at the edge of the Mount Harris Forest in the Central Range Reserve. This gritty sandstone boulder dates all the way back to the Paleocene age, forming the backbone of hills around Mount Harris. It came from the sands that originally collected on an old seafloor that is now a roadway. Imagine this was water over 60 million years ago. As enthralling as this detour is, nothing compares to Bush Bush Wildlife Sanctuary, accessed just after the 49 mile marker on the Manzanilla Mayaro Road. Even the drive through the swamp, which gets its water from the Navet, Bois Neuve and Guataca rivers, affords close-up views of indigenous wildlife and vegetation. Bush Bush, as the name suggests, is one of the forested sections of Nariva and includes Bois Neuve, 3,840 acres of hardwood forest. Bush Bush actually came into being via a 1959 exploratory trip to study the endemic cycle of yellow fever. As a result of the uniqueness of the swamp, it was declared a wildlife sanctuary in July 1968. It has a rich and varied plant life, 57 species of mammals, 171 species of birds, and 11 species of snakes, including the anaconda. The red howler monkeys that make their home here overlook the beauty of bush bush from the high treetops. In 1690, I want you to know that's when the first settlers came to Mayaro, Manzanilla and Guagayari have a care, even though they met the peaceful Arawaks there. Come up there, and you're bound to know about the legends of Mayaro, the Sukuya, Gombo, Glize, and Lagahu. Stay for a while, and you just might see one or two. Back on the main road, you can tell you are approaching Mayaro by the promontory of Point Radix, a prominent headland jutting out into the Atlantic that divides the Cocos and Mayaro Bays. The point got its name from one of the French planters who owned this expanse of land in the late 18th century. Descendants of some of these estate owners still survive to this day, and surnames such as Radix, Hughes and Frontin are still well known in Mayaro. 
Mayaro is the largest town along the east coast and one of the earliest settled villages in the island, coming into recorded history in 1690 when a Capuchin order set up a mission on this part of the coast. The name Mayaro is actually of Arawak origin, Maya being the name of a plant that was used for food and Ro meaning place, the area that the plant was grown. Radix happened to be the place where the first missionaries settled when uh, in 1687, as a, in response to the governor of Trinidad then, who was Ponce Juan Truchi Ponce de Leon, uh, in response to that, the King of Spain asked some Catalan missionaries to come to Trinidad and convert the, Amerindi uh, the Amerindians to Christianity. And the mission church was built almost exactly on the site of the present Roman Catholic Church. And the Radix grew to be the center of the entire coast. You see, because the church was there for a start, people began crowding around there, the estate was there, and um, the steamers came there, and they would take a passenger or two to Port of Spain. So if you had gone to Mayaro in 1920, what you would have had to go to, you'd have had to go to Radix, for example, because there'd have been nothing, no services or anything away from Radix. But after 1920, when, when the school and the post office and the warden's office were moved up to quarters, after that time, then Radix began to decline very fast. So this, this was the change that came over Mayaro. And this is why Radix is so important in the Mayaro scene. Mr. Winston Gould is a village elder who is still very active in the community and has a passion for Mayaro its history, its present, and its promising future. The people of Mayaro lived a sort of close family life in the past. They were little means of communication. So the people lived a close in life. As a matter of fact, when you had to leave Mayaro, you had to more or less travel by sea. We had sugarcane, coffee, and to a lesser extent, cocoa. There is one relic of the sugar estates in Mayaro, the copper. The copper, the estate owners used to boil the sugarcane juice in the copper so it to become sugar. And we still have a few coppers lying around the, 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 the district. You see a lot of coconuts growing along the Manzanilla Mayaro beach. Now, these, these, these coconuts form part of the estate, and uh, you had what you call crackers. Ladies would sit on a box with crocus bags and uh, dig out the kernel of the coconut, which were cracked by what you call a cracker man. So we had the diggers as the women and the crackers as the men. We had what you call pickers. So the, these pickers used to climb the coconut trees, either with foot ropes or what we call bicycle. Now, the bicycle is a form of loop which went around the waist of the picker and then around the coconut tree and they used it to climb up the tree. We had what you call a lot of different dances in there. We had the PK, we had the heel and toe, we had the belly. The belly was a very popular dance and I think it still is. With this rich cultural backdrop, it is no wonder that Mayaro has produced a respected artist like Edwin Hingwon, for whom the street is named. The late artist actually used to live here in his youth. When I first met Edwin Hingwon, I would say when Hingwon was about six and I was about eight, we were going to the Mayaro ROC school. And one day in 1951, I saw Edwin Hingwon. And he began telling me, well, you, you know, one of the things I do now, apart from working, is painting. He said, well, this is my great passion now. I, I tried to draw pictures and so on. And when I came back in 1970 and I heard he was ill, I went to see him. He was getting more and more nervous, and more and more he could not really use his limbs, his arms, and so on. His mother was attending to him there, helping him, and she strapped the brush at the back of his left hand I believe it was and um, he was painting with a back with a brush strapped to the back of, of his hand 
and this was so touching to see, and yet the pictures were so really remarkable. Plaisance Beach is an area where sea and fishing used to be an everyday event. It is still a beach that is simple in its quaint beauty, as the lines of fishing boats bob on the water, speaking volumes about both the economic and rural life of the Mayaro community. From Guaguayari right back to Manzanilla, the East Coast really holds our future. To tell you the truth, I am very glad to know that oil drives the economy of Trinidad. And this is one thing that everybody should know. The most oil in this country come from my arrow. So I am proud to say right down to my heart that the East Coast plays such an important part. But at the dawn of the 21st century, Mayaro's future is linked with both industry and tourism. As you head towards Galeuda Point, the countless oil rigs far out to sea tell the story of how industry and nature peacefully coexist in a peninsula that has become the industrial heartland of southeast Trinidad. It is a strictly protected area that offers many fascinating sights, one of which is the table, a prominent 300-foot long, 10-foot high stone bar that is the most southeasterly point of Galeota. It provides a strong barrier from the wild Atlantic waves, while offering local fishermen a perfect place to try their luck. Bibi Amoko has begun work on a bird sanctuary on Galeota Point. It is amazing to see macaws, parrots and pelicans living in such harmony with their environment, even with the giant of industry so nearby. The company has also introduced other animals like agoutis and porcupines to the area, which they are planning to extend as time goes on. The Amoko compound can be seen from the Guayaguayari Bay and seawall. The beach here is protected by Point Galeota on the east and Gran Cayo Point on the west. The seawall is sheltered within the bay and is a popular bathing and excursion location. The entire area, all the way across to the Trinity Hills, is oil and gas dominated. On the way to Guayaguayari, you will come upon a small village called Rustville. Well, when the first came on the scene around about 1893, after a great deal of frustrating had taken place, However, what caused him to, to come to, to Guayaguayari and Mayaro was the fact that a ward officer reported to his friend Leelam, who had a shop in Mayaro, that he found some strange substance in the forest. He sent it to England to have it tested. And the people in England sent back a report saying, you were just um, making fun with us because this could not be, be um, the substance you talked about. This is too fine a quality of petroleum to, to, be, um, have, to have been found in the forest. And in 1902, just as he was about to pull out of Guayaguayari, he struck oil. And that was the first time oil was found in Trinidad in commercial quantities. The rich forest reserve that stretches from Guayaguayari to Maruca consists of both the undulating hills of the southern range and its associated alluvial flats. The highest elevation in this range occurs at the Trinity Hills, reaching a height of only 997 feet. The East Coast is definitely an area full of interest, from its rich history of discovery to its unfolding industrial future. Here are some facts I couldn't leave alone. Miaro have trails and tradition all its own. I could beat my chest, I could brag and boast. We have so much to offer on the East Coast. From Manzanilla to Guayguayari, come along with me and you bound to see. I would be so happy, let me let you know, to welcome everybody to Miaro. da 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 Come rediscover the trails and traditions of the East Coast on the journey from Manzanilla to Guayaguayari. Feel at home at any of these guest houses during your stay. Should you prefer a day trip to the area, call any of the following tour operators.
From Port of Spain, take the Beetham Highway onto the Churchill Roosevelt. Then take the Eastern Main Road to Valencia, continuing to San Grande. The Manzanilla Mayara Road will take you all the way to Manzanilla. If you're traveling from South Trinidad, take the Naparima Mayara Road. Just after Princess Town at Matilda Junction, continue east through Rio Claro along to Mayaro.